everyone! I've been feeling awful. And I've turned to one of my biggest comforts, cozy murder mysteries, and my favorite detective, Sherlock Holmes. I've loved him since I started reading Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's original short stories and novels somewhere between 10 and 12 years old. In fact, this is the first complete collection I owned. My mom bought it for me when I saw it at Burns & Noble. I just had to have it partially because of the back photo, which suggested what Holmes' lodgings at 221B Baker Street might have looked like. My mom said, I'm not going to say no to buying you a book, and my Sherlock obsession began. She was also the first one to show me a Holmes film, but we'll get into that a little later. I've been wanting to do a series on Doral's famous sleuth for years. Originally, it was going to be a chronological retrospective on his entire movie and television and possibly radio career because I enjoy doing absurdly long series like that and seeing how a character, stories, or just a medium evolve over time. We're going to be doing things a bit differently this time, though. You'll still get a series of videos, but they won't be chronological and will instead travel back and forth through time as I talk about whatever Sherlock adaption I want. These reviews will come out on Sundays. I feel that's a great day to dive into mysteries. You won't see a new entry every Sunday. This is just when I have time and feel like it. Without further ado, let's talk about good old Shirley, Dr. J, and the rest as we discover why Mr. Holmes is known as the Great Detective. First up is 1939's The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's the first in a series starring Basil Rathbone as the great detective and Nigel Bruce as his trusted friend and associate, Dr. John H. Watson. They made 14 films from 1939 to 1946. The first two were A pictures made at 20th Century Fox and the other 12 B movies made at Universal. They're some of my favorite movies and have constantly remained strong comfort viewings over 20 plus years. It was either Hound or its follow-up, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, that my mom first showed me on a VHS, kids ask your parents, my stepdad did and still owns. He owned most of Rathbone's Holmes films, and it was by borrowing them, sometimes for months at a time, that I first experienced and reveled in the series. I can still vaguely remember the smell of the VHS cases as I popped the tapes into my player. This thinking of it calms me down and brings me so much joy. Anyway, 1939's The Hound of the Baskervilles was the seventh, sort of 13th, but I'll get to that another day, film to adapt Doyle's famous novel, which was serialized in the Strand magazine from August 1901 to April 1902. This is the first time the story had been set in its proper Victorian setting, 1889, and possibly the first Holmes film to be set in that period at all. Holmes movies up to this point were set in the time of the film's release. Information on these early films is scarce, though, and at least one movie, 1916 Sherlock Holmes, could have been set in the appropriate era. Our story concerns Sir Charles Baskerville, who was found dead on the long-held Baskerville estate in Devonshire. Dr. Mortimer, to what do you attribute the death of Sir Charles? Heart failure, sir. I might add that for some time Sir Charles was in a highly nervous state, worried. Something was preying on his mind. And did he confide to you what was preying on his mind? Well... No. But Dr. Mortimer, played by Lionel Atwell, thinks there's more to it. He enlists the help of Sherlock Holmes, played by Rathbone. There was one point which I kept back from the police, from everybody. Yes? About 
50 yards from where Sir Charles fell dead were footprints. A man's or a woman's? Mr. Holmes, they were the footprints of a gigantic hound. A hound? Well, why didn't you report it? Not a soul would have believed it. But during the night it rained, and in the morning the marks were completely obliterated, but I saw them as clearly as I see you. The Hound, in real life inspired by the demonic black dog from English folklore, has haunted the Baskervilles since the 1600s. It is said to have first killed Sir Hugo Baskerville before continuing with every Baskerville that remained in Devonshire. Sir Charles's heir and the last of the Baskervilles, Sir Henry, played by Richard Green, is returning to his estate after living in Canada for most of his life. Dr. Mortimer, who is Charles's best friend, wants Holmes to get to the bottom of Charles's death and keep Henry safe from the Hound and the Baskerville curse. Holmes is pressing business to oversee in London, but he sends the best man for the job, Watson, played by Bruce. Watson writes Holmes daily reports as Henry and the good doctor stumble upon oddities and questions Holmes needs to solve if he hopes to get to the bottom of Charles's death, the mysterious hound, and the dark moors where one wrong step means death. What or who is behind the supernatural goings on? Could be Berryman the butler, played by later famous horror movie star John Carradine, and his wife, who shares a connection with a strange man on the moors? Or perhaps Judge Franklin, played by Barlow Borland, whose passion is suing people for any reason? Or maybe it's Dr. Mortimer and his wife, played by Beryl Mercer, who has attempted many seances to contact Charles. Sir Charles, can you speak to us? Let us know if you're present. There are things that only you can tell us. Speak to us, Sir Charles, if you're here. There are things that only you can explain. Sir Charles? What happened that night? What was it you feared? Tell us, Sir Charles, of all the weird, terrible things that have happened on the moor. Or could it be Jack Stapleton, played by Morton Lowry, a scientist who's fascinated with the Moors? But maybe it's his stepsister Beryl, played by Wendy Berry, who Henry is quickly falling in love with. Screenwriter Ernest Pascal's clips and trims of the novel mostly serve to tighten the plot and produce a simpler, gothic horror story about a man haunted by a spectral hound. The fog is thick, the mood thicker. Cinematographer Pevero Marley, set decorator Thomas Little, and art directors Richard Day and Hans Peters present Dartmoor as an otherworldly land filled with mystery, peril, superstition, fear, and the ghosts of past lives and tragedies. The Hound himself is large, dark, and a portent of death. He lacks his glowing supernatural description from the novel, where he's described as having blazing eyes and a luminous muzzle, but he's still sufficiently menacing. Mixed with the atmosphere, you can believe that at any moment he might lunge on Henry from nowhere and fulfill the Baskerville curse once more. You're on edge whenever Henry is traversing the moonlit, doom-laced moors. Except for the opening and closing credits, there is barely any non-diegetic music in the film, especially for tense moments. It's been suggested that due to the quick production speed, there was insufficient time to compose and record a score. While some dislike the lack of music, I agree with others that it adds a quiet menace. Dartmoor is more unsettling because you can hear the moors, the strange animals that litter it, the howls in the night, the heavy footsteps. It puts you there with Watson and Henry, their fear more relatable. What do you think it is? What does it sound like to, to you? Well, if we were back in London, this would seem ridiculous. Let's get on. I have two issues with Pascal's cuttings. There's the loss of an entire character altogether, Laura Lyons. In the book, she's the beautiful daughter of Judge Franklin, and she provides crucial evidence for the case that Holmes in this movie just knows... somehow. Secondly, Pasco cuts or lessens the personal horrors of the characters. Without going into detail, Beryl's book storyline is bleak and tragic. It might have been a bit much for an audience just wanting an escapist gothic mystery, but the novel's Beryl gives the tale that element of darkness that permeates Doral's work. Doral was aware of life's joys, you see that throughout his stories in big and small ways, even if it's just Holmes and Watson having a laugh. But he was only too keenly aware that people can be cruel monsters in more ways than murder. He knew life could be unfair and grim. 
Barrow represented both the dark and light sides of life in the book. For the latter, it's the utter happiness of being in love. And that's something I must give Pascal, director Sidney Lamfield, and actors Green and Barry. They got the romance right. Green, who my mother said had the most adorable dimples, and Barry are cute as can be in their scenes and mesh well on screen. Pascal assists with solid dialogue, some of which I found thoughtful and surprisingly relaxed and casual for the time. Like this scene where they discuss the old ruins of a long ago people. They must have been very primitive, living on roots and dressing in skins. <laughs> but still laughing and dreaming, just as we do. I wonder how many times some young savage brought his bride into this very hut. I said, take your hat off, darling, this is home. <laughs> you know, this is probably where she cooked his first meal for him. <laughs> what a yell he must have let out when she burnt it up. <laughs> and now they're quite forgotten. Just as we will be, too, one day. Do you suppose when a man met a girl that he liked, he had to wait a respectably long time before he dared tell her? Or things like that. Sudden. Natural. I'd like to think that things were like that. Beryl, that's the way they are with me. Oh. Oh, but we've, we've only known each other such a little while. Here, <laughs> you see, convention, custom. We can't even be ourselves when we want to be. Why is that? From memory, this is one of Watson's most proactive outings in Doyle's canon and the Rathbone Bruce series, which is welcome. Watson up to this point was mostly a small player, if not missing entirely, in Holmes films. This was likely due to the literary character being an observer who wasn't much involved in the action. So it's understandable that early scriptwriters had a hard time figuring out what Watson would do in a movie. The writers of the Rathbone Bruce series played him for laughs as a dim, childlike bumbler. He was meant to lighten the mood of the gloomy stories. For those used to more recent Watsons like Martin Freeman, Jude Law, Lucy Liu, or even David Burke and Edward Hardwick from the 80s and 90s, this interpretation may surprise and possibly disappoint you. Personally, while Bruce's Watson can be eye-rollingly inept at times, I find him endearing and lovable. I wish his movie relationship with Holmes was more like two equals sharing a deep friendship rather than what it is, often a father tolerating his bungling child, but the films still communicate their warm friendship with a deep history. Playing Watson comedically wasn't unheard of. I know in the 1929 German Hound of the Baskervilles, the last silent Holmes film, Watson was at times closer to an early silent film clown mucking about and not as bright as you'd want a doctor and war veteran to be. But if you do dislike Bruce's approach, don't blame him for it he's only delivering what the writers gave him, which is mostly comedic material. I believe if the writers gave him a canon-accurate Watson, Bruce would have delivered. That's proven in small moments throughout the series where he's serious, sensible, and intelligent. If you like that more doily in Watson from Bruce, then look no further than The Hound. It's probably the most consistently close Bruce gets to Doyle's character. He's a man of action who's also practical and can be trusted when things go off the rails. Whoever it is knows his way among these rocks. We don't. Who the devil can it be? You were right about Barrowman. Yes, but what connection can there possibly be between that horrible creature and, and Barrowman? You know, I have half a mind to fire the fellow in the morning, then notify the police and let them shadow him. No, it's the last thing that Holmes would want us to do. Our job is to watch Barrowman. Watch him like a hawk. Just be prepared for his buffoonery. Look here, my man. You're up to something. I, I only ask you to try him, sir. Be careful. This thing's loaded. Who are you? Well, I might ask the same of you, sir. Prowling around the moor, spying out on everybody. That's my business, to spy. Oh, what is, is it? Yes, and if you want to know who I am, I'll tell you. Who are you? I'm Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes? The detective? Yes, and now perhaps you realize why I can't be hoodwinked. But for the most part, he's closer to Doral's Watson in this one. Maybe it's because he's away from home so much and the writers don't feel the need to make him look dumb and incompetent to make Sherlock look better. Rathbone was my favorite Holmes for years. He's not my number one anymore, but he's still two or three. He epitomizes the original Sidney Paget drawings with his angular features, sharp cheekbones, prominent nose, and perfect profile. His Holmes isn't as broad and theatrical as I think Holmes should be, he's still and subtle. He's emotionally reserved, but warmer and more approachable and sociable than his literary source, his innermost thoughts and feelings less impregnable. 
Even when he's sitting and laughing, Rathbone's Holmes always seems to be thinking. He's constantly analyzing the world around him, absorbing information that could be interesting or useful to him. Rathbone also excels at laying out Holmes' deductions, which sometimes come straight from Doyle. Like this scene where he analyzes Dr. Mortimer's cane. A present to a doctor, I'd say, is more likely to come from a hospital than a hunt. And when the letters CC are placed before the hospital, the name Charing Cross Hospital rather obviously presents itself. Oh, uh -huh. you, you may be right. Furthermore, I'd say that Dr. Mortimer had a small practice in the country and was the owner of a dog. How can you tell that? Quite simple. From the teeth marks. Look, you can see for yourself. You'd be hard-pressed to find an actor of the period who'd be a better choice for the part than Rathbone. Rathbone captures Holmes' fascination with crime and the criminal mind, and his interest in everything from types of tobacco to the strange and supernatural. He doesn't believe in the latter, but it catches his attention all the same. For in the ghostly wrappings of the Hound of the Baskervilles lies an intriguing, ingenious, devilish case that his mind must unravel. The case he solves is the trappings of mist and inhuman terrors. But, as is always the case, Holmes finds a logical solution that in some ways is far worse. The real goings-on speak to the all-too-real greed of man and the terrible lengths they will go to to get what they want. They'll trample over everybody and anybody, not caring who they terrorize, who they hurt, or what lives they ruin. But don't let that depressing thought teeter you! Like most Holmes outings, this features a dark story, adapted from an even darker book, but is all in all a fun whodunit in the cozy murder mystery fashion. And if you like this one, maybe check out Rathbone and Bruce's other 13 film outings or the radio show they did for many years. In the meantime, I'll certainly be watching more Sherlock because the game is... well, you know.